Hi everyone, welcome to this week's science podcast. I apologize for my deep voice today. If you're one of the lucky ones who's gotten whatever is going around this winter, I'm sure you understand. I want to start out by talking about some new findings by researchers at UCLA that deal with an important challenge every person with autism faces, friendships. Difficulties in friendship has, have been documented in older people and children with ASD, with about 20% of elementary school kids with autism reporting friendships compared to 60% of neurotypical kids. This part is known, but little is known about friendships as early as preschool when kids normally start to develop them. Compared to children without friends, those with friends exhibit more social behaviors and are less likely to be bullied by peers. They also have higher language skills. So some questions are, how do these skills emerge? What factors influence them? And what can parents and teachers do? As a parent of a preschooler on the spectrum, I thought this study was really important and I wanted to share it. Connie Cassery's group at UCLA has done a lot of work in this area. Her lab is one of the few to examine children in schools and try and implement interventions that affect social behaviors in school settings. So to try and develop interventions for preschoolers, first you need to understand what's going on in preschool. This was a study that looked at mainstream preschoolers. The focus was on the kids with autism, but they were interacting with non-diagnosed kids as well. The researchers observed these kids with autism in a mainstream setting and looked for markers of joint attention and also the use of gestures, initiation of interactions, and also observed how adults manage these interactions. Then they interviewed the parents and teachers and asked them to rate the child's best friendship. The results were really fascinating. First, while not surprising because of other work in the area, it is the degree of joint attention that was related to whether or not a child had a friend in the class. In fact, nearly all children with friends were using high levels of joint attention skills. This reinforces the belief that joint attention skills and intervening on joint attention are a critical component of early intervention strategies. Unfortunately, teachers rarely intervened or managed skills unless it was for behavioral management when the child disrupted the class. This sadly could be due to not enough teachers being able to guide activities. Strategies to improve joint attention were rarely used. However, a few instances where the adults intervened and prompted the child to play with their peers, the data showed promising results. The children were more aware of each other, which may be the first step in developing meaningful friendships. This suggests that adults may not recognize the importance of free play as a time to develop peer relationships, but it's important. Also, parents' and teachers' opinions of friendships were very different than what the outside observer saw. They were, how I say this, more optimistic about the quality of the interactions. The good news is that these results will be used to inform schools about the types of interventions and strategies needed to build and sustain friendships in kids with autism who are mainstreamed. And because this group has a unique opportunity to work with the LA school system, I bet that these ideas are able to be implemented in preschool. Switching from friendship and kids to toxicology and animals, I wanted to share with you the results of a very long-awaited study from the Johnson Center in Austin, Texas. Yes, I said the Johnson Center, which used to be Thoughtful House, which was the previous employer to now discredited physician and researcher Andrew Wakefield. About eight years ago, this group proposed the penultimate study, one that would look at vaccination in infant monkeys according to different schedules in order to settle the issue of vaccine safety. The National Autism Association and Safe Minds helped fund the study, along with some generous benefactors and funding from the NIH thrown in to support housing for the monkeys. The study was going to give vaccines to infant monkeys and track their behavior to a year of age. Then the brains of the animals were going to be studied and toxicology tests done. The vaccine schedules were the 1990 schedule, uh, a new 2007-2008 schedule, and just the MMR vaccine. There was also a group that had the 1990 schedule that was adapted for monkeys because the developmental trajectories of humans and monkeys is different. They even added a group that got the flu vaccine with thimerosal during pregnancy. The study itself is open access, and the link is given in this caption, and you can read the whole thing yourself. The idea at the time was if changes in the vaccine schedules, meaning more vaccines or vaccines with thimerosal in them, were toxic and produced long-lasting behavioral or biological consequences that could potentially explain autism, then this study would be able to detect it. Rodent studies had been done, but let's face it, 
mice and rats are not as sophisticated as non-human primates. Non-human primates can do different things than mice and rats can, and if a rat can't perform a complex task under normal conditions, you'll never be able to show that an exposure impaired the performance. Primates and humans are also more similar than rats and mice are to humans. So again, those organizations who funded the project wanted a study that would leave no question unanswered with regards to thimerosal and vaccine safety on autism-related outcomes. The behavioral tests were designed and performed by experts in the field at facilities with top-notch environments for this. What did they find? Well, they didn't really find much. The very early results were presented at a meeting in 2008, and at the time they reported some delays in different types of grasping, but when the fuller analysis was completed on all the animals, that effect was not seen. They saw no consistent differences in social behaviors. In fact, all animals developed typical social behaviors and no differences between groups on tests of memory and learning. The researchers then concluded that the pediatric vaccines had no adverse effects on neurobehavioral development or aberrant behavior. Toxicokinetic studies due to the mercury exposure from thimerosal are ongoing, and so are morphological studies of brain tissue obtained from these animals. So when I first introduced the study and mentioned the funding sources, I bet people were saying, oh yeah, I think I know what the results are going to be. But they actually weren't, right? The study was aimed to be well-designed and to cover all bases. Science is science and data is data. And in this case, the lack of a finding is just as important as the presence of a finding. We hope the study gets picked up by the mainstream press. Thanks again for listening this week, and I look forward to updating you next week.